principal PhD college in Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu from India, Dr. A. Jayasudha. The program coordinator stepped in to organize today's international webinar. The most valued participants, we hope we make your day a remarkable one, a bright star in your clinical diary. I welcome the nursing fraternity from India, Singapore, Bahrain, USA, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Ethiopia, and all over the world. Around 35 million people worldwide suffer from substance use disorders, while only one in seven receive treatment. The reality today is that the chapter of substance use challenges the treatment and approaches available for person since COVID-19 transmission. This idea brought out the theme for this webinar. With this beginning, it's my pride privilege to introduce the very brilliant, talented personalities who will speak and may inject the current practices for substance use into our veins. Dr. Mail Vahnan Vidasami, I'm very happy to bring in a man in nursing who is none other than the first speaker, Dr. Mail Vahnan Vidasami. Sir has been connected with PSG in 2002, graduated from RVS College of Nursing, Coimbatore, and post graduated from Savita College of Nursing, Chennai. He has traveled from south to north of Tamil Nadu for his professional uh, growth. And importantly, PhD in mental health nursing also touched the field of psychology. He has built up a beautiful career growth scale starting from the designation of clinical nurse in 2003 in Ireland till now to the current position of Assistant Director of Nursing, Community Health Organization, Terry Archard Hospital, Dublin, Ireland. He has tried with heart and soul for his professional growth through training, certification programs, presentations, and publications, and to add on many. We wish your travel as a role model for today's nursing students continues forever. Sir will be presenting on the topic epidemiological reflection. The other resource person we have here, Dr. K. Selvaraj. We have digged up to get a diamond stone with us today who is a distinguished professor in the sphere of psychiatry named Dr. K. Selvaraj. Sir graduated from Tanjavu Medical College in 1985, post graduated as MD in psychiatry at Topiwala North Medical College, Mumbai, completed his DPM DNB. Baligati means show the way. Sir has been a turning point in most of the clients' lives. As by the name, he founded the Valihati Mental Health Center and Research Institute at Coimbatore in 2002. His region of expertise, child psychiatry, psychotherapy, research, and teaching. The training, the awards, the presentations, the publications are magnificent, sir. He is a treasure of resources for many, including students from medicine, nursing, MSW, occupational therapy, and so on. So we are extremely amazed with the graph of your professional journey in the world of psychiatry. We wish you progress notes both as an eminent psychiatrist and a great teacher continues as a never ending point. Sir will be speaking to us on the topic cognitive behavioral strategies. The other speaker we have here, Dr. Abhinav Chitra. We trapped a young genius from the field of psychiatry, Dr. Abhinav Chitra, born and brought up at CMC. I mean the professional background, graduated from CMC, post graduated as MD psychiatry from CMC and currently staying at CMC at assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry. An expert at clinical psychiatry, psychopharmacology, psychotherapy, and dual diagnosis. Sir, we know you for your sincerity, dedication to the profession. Sky is the limit for the clinical spirit with which you work. We wish your progress notes with definite, indefinite number of milestones and keep pace with such educational services towards the nursing field. Sir will be speaking to us on the topic motivational enhancement. Uh, with this introduction, I invite Dr. Mail Vakman Virasami to speak on the topic epidemiological reflection. Over to you, sir.
Thanks for this invitation uh, and organizing this wonderful live webinar, which is vitally important, what is going on around us, um, when especially the COVID-19 a pandemic is going against the whole human being in the globe. So they asked me to focus on epidemiological reflection of substance use during COVID-19. So as they introduced me, I work as the Assistant Director of Nursing and Mental Health Department, Health Service Executive Ireland. I'm not going to spend a lot of time to explain about my background. And just, I know the audience wise, uh, maybe undergraduate students, postgraduates, and doctoral or degree holders and other audiences. So I tried to give a bit of uh, background as Dr. Salvaraj and Dr. Avinav is focusing on specific area. So I tried to give a bit of background as the introductory speech as well. So as we all know, alcohol, tobacco is the major problem in India and of course the whole world and also other drugs involves uh, when we talk about substance abuse, including opioid derivatives and, uh, and later treatment and everything. We will follow all those things in following slides. And WHO 2019 clearly declared that a lot of violence, injuries, and mental health problems are happening because of ongoing the substance abuse. The worst form of consequences is number of suicide across the globe, secondary to substance abuse. So just a quick glance on etiology of substance abuse. Most of us know in case if I have my undergraduate students, just like that of giving them a little bit of background. So as you see in this slide, family discordance, economic stress, domestic violence, poor interpersonal relationship, these are all happening as people are self-quarantining and they are isolated. So, and the social anxiety, depressive episode, post-traumatic stress disorder, these also get watched in this uh, highly uh, pandemic situation. When you talk about social isolation and uh, distancing from each other for two meters and everything, and ultimately they get isolation. If they have depression, they are more prone to get into alcohol addiction or taking other drugs uh, on another form. And uh, also substance withdrawal. Of course, we have seen a lot of people queuing up in front of Tasmark in Tamil Nadu. I was able to watch in television. And more or less, I know the public blame them, but there, there could be a cause is they try to avoid the withdrawal symptom. That could be the cause why they queued up for kilometers. And of course, so the, fear, uh, the teenagers seeking fun, getting high, means uh, getting stimulation experience and those, these are all the common factors. Moving on to next slide, let's talk about drug abuse behavior. So as you see uh, in the drugs, uh, in this slide, uh, it is dynamic. Uh, it, it, you can categorize uh, people get intoxication, and the next goes to more or less dependent, and then addiction, and afterwards they ended up in rehabilitation setting, or in the community making all those socio-pathology uh, situation, which may not be a uh, pleasant environment for the community as well as for their own health and the family relationship and everything. So just to the topic, just I'm trying to focus on uh, the topic what they gave me, epidemiological reflection. So when you think, when you look at the epidemiology, just quick lines, there are three factors involved here, host, environment, the agent. In my study, I'm going to focus, uh, sorry, in my uh, presentation, I'm going to focus on 
magnitude uh, problem, uh, dependence problem in uh, India. It means magnitude of substance use. A uh, document was published by uh, Minister for Empowerment uh, that talks all about between the age 10 and 70, they did vast survey across India and they focused mainly on between 10 and 70 years old people. And male is predominantly uh, alcohol. The drug. Uh, genetic profile, so we are going to talk about this host when as we go through these epidemiological figures and the environment, the temperature, altitude, and I looked at when I went through those documents uh, by the government of India around Himalayan hills, you can see people are using a lot of uh, cannabis. And when you come down uh, to the uh, south, uh, like Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Pondicherry, you can see alcohol uh, taking lead uh, rather than cannabis. In my understanding, the environment is all about uh, the geographical structure and the availability of uh, things. And housing neighborhood that also gets affected. Neighborhood could be affected because of the social distancing. And the housing where I am uh, talking from Ireland is a major issue. The climate is uh, very cold here. People live without housing. That affects, uh, that makes them to take drugs and everything. I'll come back to that. And when you think about the agent, biologic, bacteria and viral, we are talking here about viral, our uh, popular COVID-19. And chemical is alcohol and our smoke. And of course, you can add more chemicals, what we are talking about, cannabis and uh, opioid uh, derivatives. So, so these three factors, this is the way we are going to reflect today, just looking at the various factors. Right now, with the context of COVID-19, and we can uh, explore further our thought process by making effective reflection, how we can help our community who has this kind of problem. So epidemiological reflection involves the prevalence, nature, and consequences of substance use. To better understand patterns, so that means how it was, how many of them were taking alcohol or VI derivatives or cannabis or solvents, whatever it can be, and what is the trend now? I tried to pull data together because it's very hard to get um, live data, what is happening in pandemic the pandemic situation. But I tried my level best to pull data together to get uh, all of us get a bit of more reflection. Uh, trends in substance and drug use, we can talk about it uh, from WHO data in a few minutes. So this is the graphical the substance use, uh, alcohol, caffeine and tobacco illicit. When you talk about caffeine, more or less the whole uh, world 70 to 80% falls into that category. Next category, alcohol, roughly speaking, every fourth person between 10 and 70 years old is taking alcohol, uh, according to uh, our data, Indian uh, statistics. Tobacco is a major problem, of course, and the illicit drugs. There's a lot of drugs are coming out nowadays. I, I, even I came across a few things I couldn't understand in my clinical exposure, like my team. A lot of uh, stimulants and chemicals after this internet culture came in online purchasing came in, came in, it's very hard uh, to monitor what type of chemicals are out and available. So how serious it is, more than 3 million people died as a result of harmful use of alcohol and other substances in 2018. This represents one in 20 deaths. If 20 people die in the globe, one person dies secondary to substance abuse. More than three quarters of these deaths were among men. Of course, the men uh, takes uh, more alcohol globally and India as well. And Indian statistics says it's uh, out of 17 people, 16 men, one women across the country. Overall, the harmful use of alcohol causes more than 5% of the global disease. Of course, when you think about it, uh, starting from type 2 diabetes, metabolism disturbances, uh, COPD related problem when they use solvents. So, We'll, 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 we'll look at uh, another slide. So they create comorbid problem, hyperpressure, all those problems comes up, which makes the clinicians uh, feel awkward to deal with and uh, handle with. We'll, we'll talk uh, through in next slides. Epidemiological facts and figures. So 
I, I told about 3.3 uh, million deaths each year. So 15 years or older drinks 6.2 liters of pure alcohol per year. It is a worrying statistics from WHO. Less than half the population actually drinks alcohol. This means that those who do drink consume an average 70 liters of pure alcohol annually. 38.3% is global picture. I think uh, in India, 22 or 23 percent uh, of people are drinking alcohol. Comparing with global picture, we are a little bit less, but we are not uh, far away from the global level. Uh, as, as we all know, the surge of substance use is increasing, especially after COVID-19 kicked in. So 31 million persons have drug use disorders across the globe. 11 million people inject drugs, which is more complicated when you think about hepatitis C and hepatitis Prevalence of substance use across the globe. The United Nations International Drug Control Program has estimated nearly 141 million people has, uh, has been using cannabis alone. Especially the United States is getting worse. I remember uh, reading in the newspapers and the media, the, some states try to uh, legalize uh, use of um, uh, cannabis. So it's a lot of controversial thoughts are going on around the globe at the moment. Even government of Ireland here, more or less certain things are uh, legalized uh, to uh, use for medical uh, purpose. But th this is a very interesting topic, uh, especially in America. Uh, you, you can have more reading if you're interested to know how these people are advocating cannabis to be legalized at community settings. So this is a very important slide, uh, magnitude of substance use in India. Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. After 2004, I think they managed to do vast uh, uh, survey. When they did in 2004, they focused uh, the age group between 10 and 60. Whereas in 2018, I think they covered for 10 to 11 months to collect the data across the globe. High amount of sample has been included. I would say statistical reliability is quite high. And they, based on that survey report, they estimated uh, this um, data. So alcohol use, they say, so my understanding just for easy understanding, 100 gross people, uh, 100, 100 gross as a population between the age of 10 and 70. Imagine now 16 crore is using alcohol, 3.1 crore is using cannabis, opioid use 2.3, that's nearly 13.1, 21.1, 1, 21.4, 77. So nearly 22 or 23 crores of people are using one or other form of substances, which is, if I say 100,000 uh, people, nearly 20, 25%. Uh, I mean, out, uh, between the age of 10 and 70, one every fifth person or one uh, every fourth person is using one or other form of uh, uh, chemicals, I mean the substance, either could be alcohol, could be cannabis, could be opioid and inhalant. Especially when you look at the cannabis and opioid use, it's all mainly around the mountains, you know, the main area. I think the north is predominantly taking over. Alcohol use in India, when you look at the state-wise picture, Tamil Nadu in third place. Uh, I think 37 uh, crores are more or less, uh, sorry, 37 lakhs are looking for rehabilitation treatment. That means they are uh, in a uh, difficult situation, especially in this, in this context. 37 lakhs people in, uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu have significant difficulties. Now you can understand why there is a big queue in front of uh, alcohol shop. Uh, our liquor shop, uh, our off license shop in Tamil Nadu, when the government tried to do lockdown and reopen the place and everything. It's very challenging for our community, uh, clinical community as well, 37 lakhs people with trial and all, you name it. And if they have more problem and they may have the tendency to substitute some other uh, drinks, maybe locally made alcohol and everything, unrelated health problem. So when you look at the, the categorized, that survey categorized, uh, Problem users and uh, dependent users, as you can see, 
here uh, the male and female issue is explained uh, in the bottom of the slide. Uh, moving on to uh, next one, the consequences. Of course, I, I little bit covered the early part. Cardiovascular disease. Uh, this is a, the pathophysiology. Uh, I, I, I don't think I have time to go through all those things, but cardiovascular disease is quite common. Respiratory diseases, of course. Uh, when I say respiratory diseases, when people are uh, using the solvents or inhaling stuff, uh, uh, smoke and cause uh, respiratory disease. I say this is very uh, basic things we learn from uh, the beginning. Type 2 diabetes is secondary to metabolism disturbances, uh, alcohol or drugs, uh, the overeating or metabolism uh, imbalance leads to obesity. Obesity leads to uh, type 2 diabetes. Immune and central nervous system depression. Of course, uh, the whole uh, uh, the substance uh, puts knock-on effect on central nervous system, which leads to uh, uh, poor sleep or imbalanced lifestyle. All these things to uh, poor immune system, which is uh, hugely compromising in this context of COVID-19. And of course, uh, the depression is the major factor. It's a comorbid problem, uh, depression and alcohol dependence. So other psychiatric disorders also can happen. Some people get schizophrenia because hallucinations can create uh, schizophrenia-like uh, symptoms. And uh, usually alcohol dependent syndrome is always associated with one or other form of mental health issues. Uh, uh, environmental challenges, housing instability, especially like cold countries where I come from, uh, European countries, it's, about, it's very hard. Uh, four months we get here, snow and ice and everything. It's very hard to see people without housing. That's an ongoing problem, though, these are developed country. And unemployment, of course, a lot of people lost their job in this context of COVID-19. And criminal justice involvement, it is a narcotic act and everything there across the globe. But still, uh, people are well able to do drug trafficking and the drug sales are widely going. And even the countries like here, where I am living, Europe, uh, UK and Ireland and all, America is, uh, you, can, uh, you can talk about, it's a lot of issues, because you all could have enjoyed watching Hollywood movies to see how this drug gang is working. It's very difficult, even myself came across and I had to face few issues uh, and uh, when patients get admitted, I have to take the drugs and report to the police and uh, do the follow-up with Narcotic Control Act locally. Can be very challenging for clinician at your time as well when you deal with it. Thankfully, Tamil Nadu is a bit far away from cannabis, I hope. Uh, I'm not having any uh, scientific statistics, but I think uh, Tamil Nadu is okay comparing with North, uh, is my understanding, reading a few materials here. And why people who use drugs are at risk during COVID-19. So as, as I explained earlier, high level of physical and psychological health issues. Uh, of course, it starts from psychology. Uh, people get uh, self-isolation, how to stay away from the family, and people, wherever they travel, wherever they went, they were struck and unable to contact. Even I remember uh, reading the newspaper recently, some IT engineer uh, jumped from the third floor, fourth floor in Bangalore because he was not able to go from Bangalore to Tamil Nadu somewhere, I think Madurai, uh, because he was not able to see his own family and children. Of course, he has technology and everything, but that gives us a great insight and good reflection how important it is uh, to go near uh, to family or close uh, uh, and uh, relatives to stay with them and the physical presence, how it's important. Uh, so that's the big challenge for us at the moment. Asthma and COPD gets worst uh, when people are thinking uh, heroin and crack, uh, cocaine, because as you know, these substances go, get into lungs and of course it develops related pathophysiology, which leads to asthma and COPD. And COVID-19 virus loves our respiratory tract, as we all know. So a combination of asthma, COPD, uh, and, uh, 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 and with the COVID-19, you could imagine how hard it could be for our clinician who is working in ICU with all these PPE, not, not even ICU and even all the clinicians uh, from uh, across the globe. It's a very, very challenging for every one of us. And opioids such as heroin and related overdose. Say, for example, methadone management, uh, they we forced to give uh, one week supply at uh, minimum due to uh, transport network problem. And uh, 
uh, lack of uh, communication. Uh, so that's sometimes what happens when they have the tendency to take overdose. That that make a person to stop breathing really. Uh, and these drugs can weaken the immune system. So immune system is weak. Lungs is oil already. The axon saturation may be 90 or 92. And add on to this, uh, COVID-19 is getting into your respiratory tract. You can't even imagine how hard it can hit people who use substance abuse. Uh, and uh, tobacco smoking and nicotine dependence are very common. Of course, this is quite common among uh, Indian community. Uh, and adding this uh, with uh, COPD or asthma uh, plus, uh, plus uh, COVID-19, so things get more complicated. So this is the area we're supposed to reflect how we are going to handle this across not just psychiatry uh, or psychology alone, but when you think about COVID-19 gets into the system who has a psychiatric issue like substance use disorder, and this mainly goes on biological issue. And then the clinician who walks at front line is supposed to look at these factors carefully to save the life of people. Uh, and crowded environment suggests some drugs taking setting increased risk of exposure. You forget about the drug taking setting. Just Chennai itself, very populated city, at the beginning of, uh, I think it's June and all, they, they were not able to control the transmission of COVID-19 from, uh, it, I think more or less, it looked like communal transmission. Of course, the government authority denied having any communal transmission, but what happened when people uh, redistributed across Tamil Nadu? It started calm down in Chennai, but other areas started picking up. So any crowded situation, even normal crowded, normal community, uh, uh, the COVID-19 very fast uh, transmitting from one person to other person. Imagine now people who is under intoxication, taking drugs, and uh, especially in Ireland, it's a very sad situation. Uh, the homeless people I, I are managing the access team. My colleagues goes out and uh, uh, outreach people who is living on street and dealing with them uh, with this hard time uh, is shocking. Uh, I can talk about that uh, for an hour. I'm not going to get in there. Uh, I, the, the next one is uh, the healthcare and housing, as I, as I uh, covered this already. And also, if they don't have housing, they don't have address, if they don't have address, they can't access the health service. That's the way the developed countries are. That put them in a stigma and shame. They, they stay back at home, they get extremely sick, and they, we have to lift them uh, from the street to a hospital through ambulance. Sometimes we need to do airlifting as well, which is a very sad situation. People are at risk of drug overdose from using alone in isolation. Of course, this is the major problem in a modern nuclear society, uh, especially here in Ireland. Uh, uh, not the family system is valued like India, but again, people live, a lot of people live on the road. That makes a lot of problem, and especially it worsened the situation of them during this COVID-19. Uh, the withdrawal of in isolation, travel restriction could impact on chain of supply as I uh, covered in the previous slides. Say for example, methadone treatment is quite popular here and uh, because of uh, transport network problem, of course, government of Ireland is running the public transport. I, I, I would say this is the major problem in the rural area. Thankfully uh, in Dublin where I am, uh, where my service is, thankfully we are managing reasonably well because uh, the transport network is not that much affected. The government put some restriction and still piece of travel is there. But I would say in Indian setting, it's a very challenging. Sometimes people need to travel 100 kilometers to 100 kilometers to get the treatment to meet the medical uh, facilities. So I would say it is very washed uh, in our setting back home in India. Uh, so I'm sorry now, I, I tried to get uh, accurate data, the current data from uh, various resources, uh, I couldn't find a uh, very uh, effective uh, uh, specific uh, data for each state. So I took one of the sample here. Punjab has 23% raise. In the March, there was only uh, 4 lakhs and 14,000 people were registered for treatment. Between March and now, maybe a few weeks ago, ordered on. 130,000, that means 1 lakhs and 30,000 people have signed up with, since the lockdown was imposed. So just look at this picture, how badly the surge is. So 4 lakhs and 14,000 people 
added on one lakhs and thirty thousand within four weeks. So nearly one is four, four lakhs and one lakhs. Just one lakhs people started taking substance use just Punjab uh, state alone, which is very small, comparing with uh, Tamil Nadu uh, uh, and uh, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, so you can see, I, I, I can estimate uh, this picture. Uh, when you think, when you think about uh, 37 lakhs people need treatment for alcohol dependence in Tamil Nadu alone, according to 2019 statistics. Uh, but just imagine, just add on uh, with uh, maybe 10% uh, in that, more or less, uh, you, you're talking about another 10 lakhs ordered on uh, with um, uh, with the Tamil Nadu uh, population, because a lot of people uh, are nearly on uh, dependent category already. So they are falling into uh, the seriously unwell category. So nearly 50 lakhs people are suffering out there, uh, roughly speaking, by looking at this slide in Tamil Nadu alone with alcohol related issues. Uh, but again, the action plan and all, we can talk about it uh, in some other time. Uh, move on to next one. Impact of COVID-19 on substance use. Uh, of course, we are, as we all know, even uh, we can feel in our own pocket how it affected our economic situation and employment uh, and our comfort, uh, social networking, holidays, leisure, uh, social and psychological relaxation, uh, and everything is nearly gone for the last six months. The whole globe is suffering. The pandemic disproportionately affects people with substance use disorder. I was reading the article there uh, for part of preparation. Uh, one of the other wrote a pandemic within pandemic. Uh, so more or less he tried to say from America, uh, COVID-19 is pandemic. <laughs> it's secondary to COVID-19. A lot of people started using the drugs uh, and uh, especially uh, the cannabis and opioid derivatives uh, in the States. So that also getting pandemic according to that other which is a very valid point to note and which is very valid word to reflect this morning for all of us, what is happening around the globe. So impact of COVID-19 substance uh, use, uh, the pandemic leads to environment. So I, I cover that one there, uh, socioeconomic disparities, of course, uh, I cover that one as well there. Uh, current addiction care practice during the COVID-19, uh, formulate national policies, of course, uh, the, I think Indian setting, uh, the government uh, published a lot of guidelines. I, I was able to go through them briefly uh, and they are trying their level best with available resources. You know, we have a lot of scarcity. Even developed country, we all think uh, developed country has all the facilities and everything. The whole globe is struggling. Nevertheless, of a developed country, a developing country, uh, it's a major problem across the globe to uh, run the addiction service as successfully like before COVID-19. So we are like, like back home here, we are trying to do telepsychiatry uh, and you know, there are a lot of uh, technical facilities available at the moment. Health service executive where I'm working here, they bought, bought a lot of license to run the program. And then confidentiality is a big problem here in Europe and European Union. So a lot of breach of conversions, a lot of issues, then they, they, they refined and they spend a lot of money to get these softwares uh, to run the day-to-day -day things. So our clinicians, frontline clinicians has been using and this, and also we hired a few places where we can find more space and we are trying to uh, facilitate important group work and family meetings and everything at the moment uh, with using uh, adequate PPE and social distancing. So just focusing on India, uh, pneumonia versus smoking, of course, uh, as, as we covered earlier, uh, solvents and uh, then uh, smoking of uh, various substances could lead to pneumonia uh, like symptoms. And then adding on COVID-19, uh, the, the things get worse uh, and the mortality rate could be uh, high. Morbidity goes up and then mortality goes up as well, secondary substance use. Nationwide lockdown and access to healthcare facilities they caught this one. Some people have to travel too long. And closer of license, liquor shops, and several adverse outcomes. As I told, if you stop uh, supplying drugs, uh, including alcohol, for the people who use on dependent category, 
and who is more likely to develop uh, withdrawal symptoms, uh, which may lead to a lot of physical complications. And also, they may end up using substitute, making their own alcohol or uh, certain things, which, which leads to further complications. So it's a very awkward situation across the country. No clarity regarding the running of opioid substitution. Uh, one of the other from India, he wrote it in an article from North India. He clearly wrote a uh, senior clinician, uh, what is the practical difficulties he has been facing with his colleagues. So I, I would say he is talking about methadone under laser treatment. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, uh, because uh, as you, we all know, Indian geographical as a situation is very challenging. Uh, concerns regarding feasibility and activity of telehealth. Yes, do we have internet across India? Do we have uh, access to uh, 4G or 5G? It's all very good in city environment. But when you think about rural population, it's highly worrying and challenging. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, and then closer of rehabilitation has resulted because the direction from public health department is not to see people face to face. As a result, what happens, we, have, we were forced to close a, a crowded outpatient department. We have to regulate it. So the, as a result, people ended up waiting for a long time to see the clinician and discharging prematurely, creating the beds and everything. That's happening across the globe, not just India. Even in Ireland, we have been doing this. We have to stop seeing patients, too many patients, and the family meeting has to be rescheduled or canceled. Uh, people ended up waiting for long delay, and which made the situation worse on some people. So we are all facing uh, difficulties across the globe at the moment. Management strategies, of course, uh, two doctors are going to talk and focus on uh, those area, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and then I said that this is all basic things as we're always going, counseling, treatment, recovery services. But the only thing is we are trying our level best to use uh, through uh, telepsychiatry. Uh, that means using all the technology what is available with us uh, to uh, talk about these things, non-specialized services, which provide treatment to people with substance use problem. Uh, non-specialized service means not just, uh, because we, the, the department has to associate with other uh, things as well, because always they come with comorbid problem. Uh, emergency management, of course, the, the government, of, uh, the Department of Health uh, in Ireland uh, drafted all those measures and they sent bundle and bundle of documents, how to follow what are the protocols involved. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of uh, voluntary organization which is associated with HSC here. And uh, Jigsaw we call, if anyone is interested, you can Google it and see. Jigsaw is a special social agency which coordinate with us uh, to help out uh, this pro these uh, substance users in Ireland. Of course, there's a lot of NGO available in India as well. Law enforcement agencies, police, customs, forensic. It's a, suddenly a lot of uh, people using drugs here in Ireland. A lot of arrest has been made. We have been getting the data from Department of Health. A uh, number of uh, arrest, uh, secondary to use of uh, drugs and uh, drug uh, driving under the drug influence. That's increasing across the Europe and of course in America as well. I would say it's happening in India too. But unfortunately, we do not have live statistics around this. And involvement of governmental, non-governmental, private agents should be included. Of course, we have been doing it, but it's a good reflection here is, do we have enough resources uh, to do this? Management initiatives by WHO. Of course, it's again, it's, I, I, I hope everyone knows this one, this stage uh, is they introduce safer alcohol control initiatives uh, to reduce the harms caused by alcohol. Uh, they are, their target is uh, they are ambitious to uh, reduce harmful use of alcohol by 10% by 2025, which is very challenging task for WHO. It's, it was good until the COVID-19 became pandemic. Maybe it was smart goal, specific, measurable, reachable, and achievable within time frame. But I, 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 as a, I reflecting myself as a presenter myself, this is going to be very challenging uh, because already surge of substance use across the globe is getting hard, hitting hard. So I'm, it is a big challenge in for WHO how they're going to achieve this talkage. 
I would say best wishes to them. We, as a clinical uh, people, we can try uh, our level best to achieve this one. Uh, if, even if they reduce 1% by 2025, I'll be thrilled to see that, being honest. Hopefully yeah. things will change. So safer, what's that mean? Strengthened restriction on alcohol availability. Yes, stands for, A stands for enforced drink driving countermeasures. F stands for facilitate access to screening, brief intervention and treatment. So of course the assist uh, model, they developed the wonderful tool uh, all clinicians are using across the globe. Uh, e enforce bans, raise prices. It's all happening already. Where I am, we have strengthened, uh, advanced and enforced drink driving. So I told you that a lot of arrests was made last few, good few uh, months now, the stage in Ireland. Access to screening, of course, we have been doing. Nevertheless of this, COVID-19 is uh, making them to use more substances. Enforce bans, of course, the police force and uh, the uh, coast guard. I mean, I'm living in Ireland. It's coast guard sometimes arrest people and they bring uh, I mean, psychiatric conditions rather than take, taking them to the court and prison. We have to treat them before they produce them to the justice system. So we meet a coast guard as well. Nevertheless, of all, and of course, the price is quite high. The tax is quite high across the uh, Ireland, but still uh, the surge rate is uh, significantly increasing last few months. I'm, I'm sure it, the same thing is happening in our setting as well. So other strategies, primary care, addiction, mental health care system, uh, screening assessment, it's more or less, I'm, I'm repeating the same thing here, the health and social care systems to provide appropriate and cost-effective health services. With these are the recommendation from magnitude of substance use in India document. Uh, uh, so, so done by uh, National Drug Dependence Treatment Center and the AIMS uh, recommended this, uh, all those things for Indian setting. So coming back again to Ireland, this is what uh, we have been using and we have been telling our service users who, who comes with uh, things. Uh, as you see, the slide is self-explanatory. You are the risk of serious illness from the coronavirus. So same, the basic thing, don't share the drugs, wash your hands, all those, uh, the basic uh, protocol. But we are very uh, specific about the advice. What is the specific issues they get, uh, how they can mind their mental health, and what are the available resources online. We have 24 hours helpline and everything. So we have been educating them how to do this. Uh, Opening consultations. We have been working uh, hard. Uh, I'll be doing that now later on this morning. How to bring uh, back all the services, which is significantly challenging. If you're looking at the day support center yesterday. My sir. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not audible, sir. No, sir. So, mine is not mute. Ah, okay. Sir. Is it okay now? Yeah, now it's okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so, the only uh, we managed to get twenty-five percentage of population can come back to the day support center, which is a uh, very hard feeling yesterday. So what we're going to make is a bit of slot uh, of people, maybe uh, 10 people a day. They used to, we used to get 25 people come to the day support center. We are thinking of getting only 10. Which delays five cases who comes there every day and meet each other, greet each other, and uh, enjoy their gathering. So I can see just as an example, live example, what I'm dealing with my colleagues is uh, uh, as going on, so 25 patients uh, comes to the day support center. It's going to be only 10, so 50 people have to wait. So every day they come in and. Are not it. audible, sir. Happening. Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes, sir. Hello. 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 Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Uh, 
implementing process for managing and responding to COVID-19, Health and Safety Authority in Ireland produced a lot of template and document how to bring the employees back to work after this COVID-19. Be honest and proud to say Ireland is doing very well uh, to uh, control this COVID-19. Uh, we had big fight with this COVID-19, especially my department where I'm working. The first cluster came to my department. Two of my colleagues ended up in ICU. Thankfully, they all recovered and they are recovering still. One of my colleagues got significant uh, physical problem. However, uh, the island is doing well, but the thing is we have, the government is quite adamant to maintain uh, that situation. So that's what we are taking precautionary approach to reduce the services. But of course, India, it's, it's quite uh, saddened to see uh, it's, 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 it's going beyond the limit at the moment. It's very hard to control this COVID-19. So we all need to be extraordinarily careful. And of course, as a result, it makes significant impact on service delivery across India. Uh, Consciousness for alcohol use, use a disorder treatment. So we have community mental health nurses or clinical nurse specialists. Uh, we uh, recruited more people, uh, redeployed uh, people from other services to join them and task force and they go together and reach the people uh, and do the home message rather than uh, they are coming out. They are vulnerable people if they come out their uh, risk of uh, not following the social distancing advice might uh, potential to uh, transmit uh, COVID-19 to other people. So we have been doing outreach program. So my colleagues goes out and see them uh, in their home rather than they come out and see, because as a clinical people, we can use all this PPE to avoid uh, contamination or uh, transmission in the community. Alcohol withdrawal management, of course, uh, my colleagues, the pharmacy, we have a head of the department meeting more or less every week now, uh, including uh, chief pharmacists. So we all sit together and try to make it's a, alcohol addiction area is one part for my uh, area. I don't uh, do fully in charge for this area, but uh, my colleagues uh, uh, cover uh, this particular uh, department, this addiction department. Uh, telehealth, I told you before how we have been uh, handling and how we are using the software and prescription and refills. Uh, they changed the protocol here. Maybe the email, uh, e prescription, it came up and they developed the, the thanks for the technology. Uh, we can uh, do online now. That's, that's being approved by Medical Council. And of course, the advanced nurse practitioners and clinical nurse specialists are helping the medics significantly in this uh, COVID-19 here. My colleagues who has a nurse prescription course, they have been doing extended role and uh, doing the prescription uh, as record because of uh, because they can go home and uh, assess the person and they can do the prescription uh, because clinicians are very busy in the hospital setting dealing with this uh, uh, challenging COVID-19 time. Conscious for high risk patients, of course, uh, in my uh, settings where I'm in charge for 60 residents who live in hostels, we call them. Uh, and uh, we sat together with all the clinicians, all the MDT, we categorize the people high, medium, low risk. High risk means people who use drugs and the comorbid illness, lungs issues, and any other physical problem like uh, comorbid uh, type diabetes or hypertension, we categorize high and we developed the protocol and algorithm in case if they get COVID-19, how to deal with it. And of course, a lot of guidelines are available on the website of Health and Safety Authority. They have been incorporating those things and we, we are ready, uh, like, you know, because just to get ready all the documents together, one A4 sheet summary of the person because uh, COVID-19 can significantly damage the person within 24 hours, even 48 hours in case if they have comorbid and serious physical health problem. So we prepared and if anything happens, we can uh, we can uh, proactively act on it, and then we can transfer them to a general hospital. Providers and programs should continue to implement policies and procedures to reduce risk of this is uh, politicians and uh, other people area not going to focus on those strategic stuff. So I'm trying to share my practical experience what I have been facing uh, uh, last few months with my colleagues to deal with this situation. So I'm nearly uh, getting only two more slides to go. I won't be long. 
uh, how can substance abuse be handled during the pandemic situation in India? Uh, when I went through a lot of documents, uh, there is a recommendation of reframe the public health policy according to Indian context. Need to open telecounseling support services. I'm not sure how far this is all established in our setting back home in India. People worry under healthcare services. That's very challenging as well. Collaborate with voluntary organizations. Very, very important as we all know government, both central and state governments, we do not have enough resources. The medics and all uh, nursing colleagues are struggling a lot at the moment. In fairness to government, they are trying their level best to support, but the lack, a lack of uh, resources and scarcity, uh, which is challenging situation. So voluntary organization is very important. They play a vital role in our Indian setting. Access to outpatient service and essential medicines. Uh, of course, this is again a responsibility of uh, government department of health, making sure that they are facilitating the service to the patients to reach uh, and availability of uh, medicines, controlling the inflation uh, of the cost of medicine. Of course, as we all know, when the demand increase, supplies go down and they make induced demand in market. Uh, uh, that's quite popular in Indian settings. I would say they, they will try to do for the medicine as well. That has to be regulated to make sure that uh, in this crisis time, people are able to get medicines and it's not, it is cost effective for them. Improving the two-way communication between people and the government healthcare agency. I hope that's happening. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, last 25 years, 30 years, significantly things have improved in Indian setting. Controlling measures to minimize the psychosocial stresses. Uh, of course, we, uh, the social networking, I know the mobile network is good, uh, but still, uh, not is going to replace face-to-face -face meeting or uh, meeting each other, greeting each other in one place. Uh, that's a significant challenge for all of us, especially alcohol anonymous, narcotic anonymous group. I'm not sure how far we are doing back home. We have to forcefully, we have to stop here and we reduce the number of people who participate uh, in that group as well. That's a good context to reflect on this uh, topic. Utilizing private and corporate healthcare agency towards the pandemic service. Of course, when you talk about corporate healthcare agency, uh, uh, my understanding is this is uh, uh, the insurance, uh, health insurance crowd, uh, and how well they are helping the community at this crisis situation across the globe and especially in India. So, uh, what is the take home message? So, United Nations Secretary uh, clearly uh, said. Uh, don't ignore treatment of your mental health during COVID-19. That's nothing but psychosocial stresses. A yearly stage, try to get uh, proper advice uh, from uh, clinicians. Uh, his own word, uh, Ian, uh, Secretary, what the world now, world needs now is solidarity. With solidarity, we can defeat the virus and build a better world. And then World Health Organization, coping with stress during the COVID-19, as I told you in my third slide, I think the second slide, uh, how uh, the causes, uh, what are the causes, how uh, the, the, we develop into stress and then get into this uh, addiction habit, especially uh, it is more, more vulnerable during this uh, isolation period. So that, that slide talks about uh, how to cope with stress. Uh, it's uh, recommended by WHO. 10 practical tips for supporting mental health during COVID-19. That's uh, Mental Health Ireland uh, published this poster. So acknowledge your concerns together. Brainstorms the things you are doing well together. Shout to your loved one about their needs and your own. Do up or review your crisis plan. Ensure you have important numbers, one safe place. Uh, find because that's that's for the people who is unwell. That's what I was talking about earlier on. Our patients who lives in the community, we prepared uh, and we categorize them uh, uh, high, medium, and low, and uh, all the numbers, next of kin, uh, close contact, and everything. Because the things are happening rapidly, death and everything. So we prepared that document already. Find uh, and add the numbers to give this list useful. Yeah. That's all the social services, tele uh, services, 24 hours helpline, ambulance number, uh, urgent A and E, uh, external emergency uh, contact number locally based on that catchment area in case if they struck and not able to think properly. Uh, and the mental health team call, we have been uh, 
we developed a poster with the social work department and they, every uh, uh, resident got the letter uh, by post, all this basic information. Made nearly, I think they made four or five page document. Uh, uh, we circulated that. Have you chat with some friends and neighbors? Of course, that's a social networking. Uh, identify supports to help with uh, shopping, pharmacy if needed. Uh, just because say, for example, some of our patients uh, cannot understand, they cannot process the information of uh, public health recommendations. So we have to appoint that advocate from the voluntary agencies to do shopping and everything for them. Uh, my community medical nurses are coordinating with them to organize that type of things to avoid communal transmission. I just know that you can do this and you are not alone. That's a positive message from Mental Health Ireland uh, document. So this all the information we have, we, we need to think of uh, when, when you talk about uh, epidemiological reflection, what is going on at the moment. And uh, thank you very much. I know I meant to take only 45 minutes, but I took a little bit extra. My apologies for the organizers and other two doctors who is very busy in their clinical schedule. Many thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It has been an excellent deliberation of the statistical information which you have given on a global scale and from India. Um, all informations, uh, uh, I feel the participants would have gained to their side. Uh, this particular statement which we have from the state of Tamil Nadu is alarming, like it's a recent information which is available uh, during the last week. After the lockdown release, 190 crores have been generated from the Tasmak shops. I hope your presentation linked with this data uh, has created an awareness and uh, we are in the stage of offering a help and support to this particular category of uh, clients. There is a question from the participant side, sir. I hope you have your presentation has answered her. Uh, from Nirmala Nanaturai, madam. How far has nurse entrepreneur you can prevent strategies are available in Ireland? I hope question. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having connected to webinar. And we have a great person for us today to speak on cognitive behavioral strategies. I welcome Dr. Sanj to take over the session. Sir, you can go ahead, yes. sir. Yes, sir, you can go ahead, sir. Yes. Good morning. Shall I start? Uh, yes, sir. Good morning. Sir. Good morning. Uh, respected Chairperson Dr. Jay Sudha, fellow speakers Dr. Mail Vahanan and Dr. Abhinav, and uh, friends and students in the audience. A very good morning. Uh, Dr. Mail Vahanan has given an epidemiological reflections. Uh, this COVID-19 situation has increased the need or help for substance use disorders and addictions. People having more withdrawals and where available people are taking lot of substances and alcohol because they don't have much to do and the healthcare system is uh, taxed with uh, people with withdrawal and uh, severe addictions. Now we will go into the treatment strategies and uh, the next 30 minutes, I am uh, planning to give a broad outline. Uh, we'll touch upon the history of the de addiction treatment and uh, uh, introduce the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy, a broad outline, and some specific strategies in addictions and some practical aspects. I use the word addictions um, because using the word substance use disorder every time is going to be cumbersome. 
history of addiction treatment uh, actually we all know uh, thirulluvar our sage has uh, even talked about kallurnamai uh, it has been there uh, ever since mankind was there however it was a social evil rather than a disorder only in uh, uh, 1700s the concept of alcoholism as a disease was entertained in 1984 benjamin rush a doctor uh, first argued that alcoholism is a disease and should be treated from then on uh, in the western countries uh, de addiction treatment were progressing uh, in 1800s uh, the treatment was just lodging homes people were uh, kept up in asylum kind of homes and uh, only in uh, 1900s uh, the real seriousness came in for treatment first new york city substance abuse hospital was started in 1901 and uh, alcoholic anonymous was formed in 1935 and diselfiram and other drugs are used to treat alcoholism in 1948 to 1950 so uh, only from then onwards the scientific uh, treatment uh, started progressing the evolution of addiction addiction treatment goes as follows as i said initially it was uh, custodial homes later medications were hoped to cure uh, addictions but uh, later they realized that drugs are not going to help so they need uh, psychosocial interventions and behavioral therapy came into the picture but after some uh, decades they realized the limitations of behavioral management alone they then started focusing on the thinking process and that is so cognitive therapy became important later both the cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy got merged into cognitive behavioral therapy which is one of the powerful management strategy for addiction treatment of late what we call uh, third wave uh, uh, treatments mindfulness and uh, acceptance and commitment therapies are all coming to, coming into the picture for the treatment of addictions well we are going to uh, talk only about uh, cbt uh, what is cbt cognitive behavior therapy it is a form of uh, talk therapy a method of psychotherapy well we are all familiar with uh, uh, psychotherapy well this slide uh, uh, is the essence of cognitive behavior therapy uh, if you see uh, which addresses the cognitive behavior therapy the behavior thoughts and feelings they are all interconnected they influence each other in multiple ways these three are influenced by our core beliefs which is about our self and about other people and about our future majority of the clinical situation can be brought into these areas there can be behavioral problems thought problems feelings problems and it may be emanating from uh, perception about self others and worries about the future this model aaron p beck's model evolved over a period of time though it initially started only for depression now it is being used for uh, addictions as well with the modifications uh, <clears throat> cbt used in addiction treatment uh, in a way uh, to provide a model of care and uh, it uh, teaches uh, people with addiction uh, about how to go about uh, dealing with their addiction problem it encourages them supports them more importantly cbt provides skills to be abstinence from drugs in uh, reducing their drug use as well 
Now, the basic concept of CBT is uh, uh, addiction is a learned behavior. Now, that's the essence and it can be unlearned. So that is the premise on which the whole uh, CBT treatment unfolds. Addictive behavior is learned through a set of behavioral psychological principles and using our understanding of these phenomena, we can treat addictions. The basic concept of uh, uh, CBT addictions are uh, the uh, learning and conditioning principles involved in CBT are classical conditioning, operant condition, and modeling. These three components uh, we are going to address in the next few minutes. Uh, basically, uh, these uh, uh, principles, how they contribute to development of uh, addictions and as well as how these principles can be used for the treatment of addictions. Let's talk about uh, classical conditioning. Uh, well, we all know about uh, a Pavlov experiment involving dog. A dog usually salivates when it sees the bone or food. A bell doesn't really make any difference to it, but whenever the bell is rung, then the food is delivered. There is an association between the food and the bell. After some time, uh, by the mere ringing of bell, uh, the dog in anticipation of food salivates. This is learning by association. This is a very important uh, phenomena that happens during the development of addictions. Repeated pairing of particular events, emotional states or cues with the substance use can produce craving for that substance. Over time, drug or alcohol use is paired with cues such as money, particular such places, people, time of the day and emotions. Eventually, exposure to cues alone produce drug or alcohol craving or urges that are often followed by substance use. Well, understanding and identifying the triggers, that is the cues that have been conditions is a major dimension of it. And uh, related to that is understanding how and why our drug craving occurs. Whenever there is a trigger, for uh, substance use which has been conditioned, it elicits drug craving in the person. So uh, we have to uh, teach the individual to learn strategies to avoid exposure to the triggers. Once the trigger happens, then it is a big challenge. Even then it is not uh, always avoidable, but once they have got exposed, and uh, uh, the craving happens because of the triggers, they should learn to cope with it. And uh, they should be uh, able to reduce the craving or even eliminate the uh, craving so that they can uh, protect themselves from going back to substance use or alcohol. Well, that is about classic conditioning. The operant conditioning is a, another form of learning. Uh, this is uh, simply under, can be simply understood as the rewards and punishment. Uh, drug use is a behavior. This is uh, uh, reinforced or encouraged by the positive effects that occurs from the pharmacological properties of the drug. Somebody smokes a cigarette, he gets a kind of relaxation. Somebody takes an alcohol, they get a kick and a pleasure out of it automatically uh, increases that uh, uh, drug use behavior. That is reinforcement. Negative reinforcement also happens uh, while uh, drug and alcohol use. Uh, while somebody has been habituated with uh, uh, substance or alcohol use, after some time when they 
stop taking alcohol they experience a lot of withdrawal symptoms this unpleasant withdrawal symptoms uh, is uh, relieved by taking the drugs so in order to uh, escape from the suffering and the unpleasantness they end up using the substance this phenomena is called a negative reinforcement this is also a very common uh, powerful factor uh, operates during the later part of addiction positive reinforcement strengthens a particular behavior that is the drug taking behavior pleasurable effects from the pharmacology of the drug uh, enhances drug taking behavior this happens in the early part of uh, addiction career and peer acceptance uh, obviously encourages the person to go for uh, taking drugs and alcohol uh, any reinforcement increases the uh, behavior any punishment decreases the frequency of behavior these both operate uh, based on the operant conditioning principles well uh, this operant conditioning principle is very useful in functional analysis that is to identify the high risk situations uh, for drug and substance use and determine what are the reinforcing factors uh, these uh, consequences to uh, drug and uh, alcohol related behavior we have to uh, evaluate the long term and short term consequences so that we will be able to uh, identify the reinforcers and deal with them and uh, to do that uh, we can schedule time and use the price to reinforce and uh, thereby we can modify the frequency of the behavior so we are uh, as per operant conditioning principle uh, drugs and uh, alcohol are used for pleasure but if we can develop a meaningful alternative for pleasure and relaxation we can uh, deal with the drug and alcohol use well another important uh, behavioral psychological principle is modeling modeling is to imitate someone or follow the example modeling is a process in which one person observes the behavior of another person and subsequently copies the behavior well we know about models and modeling which is a uh, common word used in the society young children are uh, uh, easily affected by this modeling effect uh, they experiment with cigarettes almost entirely because they are modeling adult behavior teenagers start with the cigarette because they start believing that it is an adult like behavior and they model their uh, uh, cigarette smoking adults during adolescence modeling is often the major element in how peer drug use can promote initiation into drug experimentation these are friends who are doing they will imitate and model their friends but it can be used for therapy as well clients learns new behaviors through role plays and one important uh, uh, skill they can learn through modeling is the drug refusal skill uh, watching clinician model new strategies uh, is a very powerful method of teaching and uh, those uh, skills can be practiced as a very important uh, strategy to manage uh, uh drug use behavior okay the very important uh, strategy of uh, the early stages of cbt treatment uh, behavioral focus is more the strategy stress on behavioral change uh, uh, to that end uh, that time to engage in non drug related behavior is focused and uh, avoiding or leaving a drug use situation is of paramount importance 
the more a person uh, goes closer to a usual place they use drug it is a high risk situation so in order to manage that there will be a planned schedule of low risk activities which we will use calendars and uh, schedule those low risk activities as a competition with uh, high risk activities like drug abuse and they should be able to uh, identify the high risk situations also thereby they can avoid particularly meeting friends uh, in the evening uh, in a common place where uh, it is uh, located near a bar is a high risk situation which needs to be avoided however avoidance is not always possible so they should learn to cope with the situations when exposed using coping skills uh, coping skills more uh, using uh, coping skills more effectively with a range of problems is important many problematic behaviors uh, can be dealt with the developing uh, the specific coping skills as cbt treatment continues into the later phase of recovery uh, after the patient is engaged uh, the more emphasis is given to the cognitive part of cbt uh, teaching clients knowledge about addiction and uh, make them become aware of the conditioning triggers and craving all these things will give them a better understanding of uh, what they are suffering from how they can cope with it and uh, cognitive skills like thought stopping and uh, urge surfing can be uh, very well taught uh, eventually uh, once they are well into the recovery phase uh, we will focus on relapse relapse prevention which is a common occurrence in uh, addictive disorders well uh, now uh, we are going to attend uh, few areas specific areas uh, which is used in the management of uh, addictive disorders uh, we can call it a strategy and techniques uh, in the assessment functional analysis is a very important technique and uh, this can be simply stated as uh, five w's one of the first task in conducting cbt is to learn the details of a client's drug use it is critical to know how the drug use is connected with other aspects of a client's life the five w's are uh, at the core of functional analysis the five w's of a person's drug use uh, can be elicited using these questions when where why with whom uh, what happened so when do they use the drug and alcohol frequently what time what situation uh, which place from where they procured the drugs and in what kind of situations they start using what are the external triggers and what are the internal triggers and uh, what what is the frequent trigger for craving and whether they are drinking alone or uh, using it with a friend uh, with whom they use it frequently all these things can be elicited to give a clear understanding and eventually after the drug use what happened whether it was a pleasurable uh, experience that makes them to go back in again and again was there any adverse consequences which happened but they are uh, minimizing the importance of it all this needs to be uh, looked into in the functional analysis of their drug use behavior so the questions like what was going on before you used uh, how you were feeling before you used uh, all this will give a clue about the triggers and uh, uh, what provoked the craving and uh, where uh, they obtained drugs and uh, with whom they used drugs uh, what happened after they used will clear give a clear understanding of which are essential for planning the treatment well uh, it is a, a very objective structured way of eliciting that information uh, uh, we can see that in the first column the analyzes the antecedent situation 
uh, where was the person, who was with that person, and what actually, actually was happening, whether they were chit-chatting without any work, or uh, was there any uh, uh, conflict. And, uh, and during those situations, what was the thought process that was going through? What kind of feelings and sensations the person was uh, experiencing? And it uh, led to what kind of behavior? What did I do? And what did I use? How much I take? And what are the other paraphernalia that I use? All these things can be elicited uh, in this. And eventually, after the drug use, what, what happened after that? What was the feeling? And how did the other people react? Was there any unforeseen consequences like accidents and uh, legal consequences? All this can be elicited in the functional analysis. Well, the uh, real value of functional analysis is finding out the triggers and the craving that is elicited in the patient. And uh, these are all the very important strategies in management of uh, substance use. One of the most important purpose of this 5Ws exercise is to learn about the people, places, things, times, and emotional states that have become associated with the drug use for your client. These are referred to as triggers. These are all conditioned cues which they have developed over a period of months and years because of repeated use of uh, substance use. One sec. Hello, uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, I got the feedback that the volume is not adequate. Uh, I wonder whether uh, it, it's uh, any better. Yeah, um, uh, a trigger is a thing or even or a time period that has been associated with drug use in the past. Triggers can include people, places, things, time periods, and emotional state. It can be external or it can be an internal trigger in the form of emotional states like anger, boredom, depression, anxiety. Triggers can stimulate thoughts of drug use and uh, cravings for drugs. So they end up using the drugs. External triggers can be uh, the people, the friends with whom the person has been uh, taking drugs, or it can be the persons who sells and pushes drug dealers. Yeah, the particular places get conditioned with our uh, drug use and automatically we start experiencing the uh, craving like uh, bars and a particular person's house and parts of the town. Many times people go out along with their friends to a particular park or uh, some uh, outside place. Uh, so when they even go to that spot, automatically the craving, uh, they start experiencing. The things like uh, money, whenever they see money, the immediate thought goes to uh, about pur purchasing the substance. Uh, 
and even uh, uh, going to a movie or a dinner uh, it gets associated with uh, alcohol use and particular time period also contribute to the uh, uh, triggers and the craving uh, particularly holidays evening time even when there is money and whenever uh, there is stress uh, uh, hard working and demanding situation all this can create a, a trigger for uh, uh craving and subsequent uh, use internal uh, triggers are commonly emotions anxiety anger frustration sexual arousal excitement boredom fatigue and happiness any of this can be uh, can uh, trigger craving well uh, this uh, triggers and experience of craving happens in the high risk situations and uh, uh, if we uh, avoid those high risk situations we are likely to protect uh, ourselves from uh, use of drugs so uh, choosing a low risk situation is a very important strategy uh, in managing addictive disorders situations that involve triggers and have been highly associated with the drug use are referred to as high risk situations uh, places people situations that have never been associated with the drug use are referred to as low risk situation an important cbt concept is to teach clients to decrease their time in high risk situation not spending yeah, time with uh, friends uh, outing <laughs> time in uh, uh, low risk situation like with the family members at the home or with the friends who do not uh, use substances well uh, apart from avoidance uh, we have to have coping skills uh, to manage uh, a, a high risk situation and because it may not be always possible uh, for anyone to avoid the high risk situation so they need to have coping skills and strategies when they are faced with high risk situations uh, well any high risk situation can cause craving a craving is a intense desire for the substance and uh, it brings in an urgency to go for the drug many people describe craving as similar to a hunger for food or thirst for water it's a combination of thoughts and feelings there is a powerful physiological component to craving that makes it very powerful even very difficult to resist once the craving uh, is experienced it's a big challenge for the substance user to fight with it struggle with it cravings are urges are experienced in a variety of ways Uh, by different clients for some the experience is primarily somatic for example i just get a feeling in my stomach churning in my stomach my i have palpitation uh, i feel an excitement somatic for some people it is mental craving is experienced more cognitively for example an urge to consume it now i can't uh, uh, be at peace without taking that uh drug i cannot uh, take out that thought from my head i have a, a, a strong urge to go for it so it's a cognitive experience so a craving can be experienced experienced both ways many clients believe that once they begin to crave drugs it is inevitable that they will use it but it is not necessary in their experience they always give in to cravings as soon as it begins and use drugs instead they can resist craving using some techniques and uh, 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 developing some mastery in managing craving in cbt clients are given techniques to resist craving a very very simple technique uh, is which is taught is 4d's the four d's are uh, one is delay whenever there is a craving uh, delay 
delay yourself to going to drugs or take a deep breath and uh, deep breathing will uh, will uh, bring down emotional excitement sometimes just plain drinking water can reduce the craving or even going for food can uh, affect the craving and distracting oneself uh, in that situation again they can uh, reduce the craving so these kind of uh, uh, skills and techniques can help them to uh, manage uh, craving and they need not always uh, go to uh, addictive substances just because they experience craving so it can be uh, managed uh, by using a daily record of urges to drink commonly used in alcohol so you so you'll have a record of date time the situation uh, it can be including anything about the situation your thoughts your feelings uh, whichever that triggers the urge to drink and it can be varying suppose uh, you see uh, one friend uh, uh, in a temple uh, you no know, your craving will be uh, lower but when you see the same friend near a bar in a remote place with money you may have a, a higher intensity of uh, craving so that also needs to be uh, uh, documented and what coping behavior uh, was used use this column to note how you attempted to cope with that urge to drink if it seems like it would help note the effectiveness of your coping strategy by this kind of a, a daily record of uh, uh, triggers and the craving experience one can uh, chart out uh, uh, what is the common uh, trigger and where do they frequently experience craving and what strategies are going to help them so that that can help them in planning the treatment so this is a daily record of uh, adjust to drink that has been used uh, this about the date this is about the situation the intensity has been varying uh, in the scale of 1 to 100 it is 75 at one place and uh, on a pay day it is uh, 68 and what coping behavior was used when they look at and analyze this data they will uh, evolve better coping strategies coping with craving uh, particularly the more and more they engage in non drug related activity uh, the situation uh, uh, causing craving is reduced and whenever they experience craving they can talk about it and discuss that with a friend or uh, they can use techniques like thought stopping and uh, of course they can come to a counselor uh, or they can even if they are religiously inclined they can pray thereby that craving can be managed well uh, in spite of all the efforts by a person the environment can be so powerful particularly the peer group friends will start offering uh, the drugs and the substances and uh, one should develop uh, drug refusal skills uh, it may not be easy to Uh, give away certain close friends who are using drugs but still one can uh, protect himself uh, from using drugs by using the drug refusal skills how to say no to drugs and alcohol another most common relapse situation is when a client is offered by a friend or a dealer many find that they don't know how to say no frequently their ineffective manner of dealing with this situation can result in use of drugs so uh, a drug refusal skill is a very critical element in social situation even uh, when they are uh, uh, motivated the friends can come together and force them to accept drugs and they should have uh, enough assertiveness to say no improving the refusal, refusal skills are assertiveness Uh, there are several basic principles in effective refusal of drugs they have to quickly respond rather than hesitating to say no 
and they should have a good eye contact and respond with a clear and firm no that does not leave uh, any doubt in the minds of the listener and it has to be a brief conversation and if they continue to insist on uh, uh, using drug they should leave the situation so these drug refusals is once practiced uh, for a couple of times they will feel more confident and comfortable after reviewing the basic refusal skills clients should practice them through role playing problems in assertive refusal should be identified and discussed it can actual situation that occurred recently for a client and that can be uh, used in role play ask clients to provide some background on the target person who are particularly uh, forcing them to consider drug use well uh, people give up drugs and alcohol and they remain sober uh, for uh, weeks and months sometimes years however it is not first time they went for treatment and they are completely free from drug use uh, continuously from the first attempt they frequently relapse this happens as a norm as a routine rather than an exception and whenever they relapse uh, from abstinence Uh, there can be a lot of confusion uh, that is called abstinence violation effect that also need to be uh, dealt uh, and cbt has got uh, very good techniques if a client slips and uses drugs after a period of abstinence one of the two things can happen he or she could think i made a mistake now and now i need to work harder at getting sober so i have to put extra effort to remain sober i have to be all the more care, careful that may be one way of thinking or that person can think just because they uh, used it again uh, this is a hopeless situation i will never get sober i might as well keep uh, using that drug so after one uh, lapse they feel hopeless and they start using more and more of the drug which is not warranted this thinking is uh, uh, called abstinence violation syndrome which is uh, uh, detrimental to the treatment program uh, most of the time they think one lapse means a total failure i may as well keep using it i am responsible for all bad things i am hopeless and uh, i will always remain a drunk hard i don't know i will power i have lost control Uh, i am physically addicted so i can't really escape from it all these kind of negative thoughts can be uh, happening in their mind but clients need to know that if they slip and use drugs it does not mean that they will return to full time addiction they can that uh, thought process can be reframed the clinician can help them to reframe the drug use event and prevent uh, lapse in abstinence from turning into a full full blown addiction for example uh, one person saying i used last night the drug again but i had been sober for uh, 30 days before so a way to look at it is out of the 31 days uh, i have been sober for 30 days that is that has to be the focus and uh, rather than uh, you know using it to one day one laps and uh, if they look back uh, their long uh, use of drugs 30 days is a, a good uh, effort considering their long term use of for the 10 years so that is how we reframe that uh, lapses and prevent it from becoming a full blown uh, reuse well uh, if we, we say a single statement Uh, de addiction or uh, uh, escaping from uh, addictive behaviors means it is a lifestyle change because the substance gets uh, integrated into the uh, uh, life of that individual many clients have poor or non existent repertoire of drug free activities uh, all their have is work 
then they go back to drug use and very little they do other than drug use particularly when they are moderate to uh, moderate and severe addiction efforts to shape and reinforce attempts to try new behaviors or return to previous non drug related behavior is part of cbt the uh, important uh, lifestyle management uh, includes some specific skills particularly anger management skills uh, many clients uh, go to substance use when they have strong emotions like anger clients are taught about the warning signs of anger both external and internal signs so they can identify uh, identify them early and manage skills for managing anger includes the use of uh, calm down phrases identifying aspects of situation that are provoking anger and considering options that might help to resolve the situation yeah they should uh, develop relaxation skills uh, uh, that is uh, uh, jacobson uh, progressive muscle relaxation technique can be taught to them so that they will be able to understand the tensed state and relaxed state in addition to relaxation uh, they can be taught slow breathing and uh, use of calming imagery to relax themselves these skills are practiced and acquired clients can be taught to apply them in various situation particularly when they are stressful problem solving it's a very important skill it provides means of coping if clients unavoidably enter a uh, difficult situation for which they have no apparent coping response that is immediately available to them the problem solving skills uh, include various steps uh, problem recognition and uh, components of the problem and uh, what possible solutions brainstorming the potential solutions with others selecting the most promising approach trying it out and uh, assessing its effectiveness and refining the plan if necessary it's a systematic way of approaching any problem once they practice this skill any unexpected situation the client will feel confident to cope with criticism is a very important uh, experience in persons using uh, addictive substances criticism whether giving it or receiving it can be high risk situation since it is often leads to anger and subsequent drug use uh, this is even more the case when receiving criticism about drinking drinking or drug use clients are taught to calm down first to state the criticism in terms of their own feelings use a firm and clear tone of voice but not an angry one to criticize specific behaviors and repeat and request a behavioral change and to be willing to work out a compromise most of the time whenever there is a comments or criticism about about a person's drug use behavior they become defensive or counter attack to ask other person to clarify the content and purpose of the criticism to find something in the criticism to agree with and to work towards formulating a compromise in this way criticism may be transformed into a potentially constructive communication well a uh, 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 brief uh, uh, few words about uh, the cbt session the session lasts generally about 60 minutes uh, it's a highly structured uh, session and the therapist is very active uh, that 60 minute session can be divided into three parts each 20 20 minutes and uh, during the uh, therapy session an empathy and acceptance should be balanced with own teaching and coaching <clears throat> so in the first 20 minutes uh, there has to be an agenda for the session that has to be set and we have to evaluate what has happened in the past week with regard to uh, current Uh, uh, patient's life and uh, uh, particularly what were the 
problems in the social area, in the environment, in the workplace, in their physical health or emotional health, and how they were functioning, and how much they were using the substance, and what kind of a high, high risk situation they face, all this will be uh, assessed. And if there has been a homework assignment, whether uh, they practiced it, and what was the outcome, all this will be assessed in the first 20 minutes. In the next 20 minutes, a specific topic will be introduced and it will be discussed. And that topic and the theme will be correlated with the patient's uh, current situation. And they will even practice the skills which are learned during that. And uh, during the final 20 minutes, there will be rechecking on the understanding of the patient on the topic. And uh, there will be exercise, practice exercise given for the next week. and. Uh, and a discussion about what potential problem they may anticipate during this uh, coming week. All this can be addressed. So there will be about uh, uh, about 12 sessions in any uh, serious uh, attempt to give uh, CBT to a person with uh, addictive disorder. And each session have a specific theme. And uh, after five, six sessions, and uh, there can be a few sessions which there can be a topic of interest to patient. They can choose topic and there will be a termination in the follow-up. Okay. Uh, there are some important principles for CBT. Uh, I will just touch upon, I think the time is catching up. Uh, it has to be highly individualized. Uh, each client is different. So depending upon the patient profile, we have to match the, our content of the treatment, including the examples and the homework assignments. Anything uh, that we teach needs repetition. And uh, several attempts have to be made uh, for uh, learning the skills. And uh, repetition is essential because of the drug use difficulties. They may be inattentive, their memory may be weak. And, uh, uh, particularly uh, about the triggers, they should be constantly repeated. Uh, even a whole session can be repeated if the patient is uh, not uh, picking up the skills. Practice makes things perfect. Any skill requires uh, practice. And uh, whenever they practice anything, there will be mistakes and they should learn from the mistakes. And they continue to master the skill by trying it again and again. Monitoring is a very important component in uh, behavior therapy and cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, we should uh, monitor by getting the information and uh, checking on the task completion that was given to them last week. And we should discuss the client's experience with the uh, task so that the problems can be addressed in the session. Of course, uh, appreciating the client for their uh, Effort is a very, very important uh, uh, strategy from the clinician. Even small attempt, even small success to be celebrated and appreciated. There will be resistance on the part of the uh, client to take up uh, practice and homework assignments. Um, so that needs to be attended to and evaluated. <clears throat> Many times they may feel hopeless do you think, uh, uh, is it going to really help me? They may not even try their uh, practicing of coping skills. So that has to be discussed and uh, they should be encouraged to practice that. So uh, it's a, a brief uh, presentation uh, giving an, an idea about CBT. Uh, a CBT is often rated as the most effective approach to treatment and it is well accepted and well received by clients nowadays. There has been a lot of refinement. Furthermore, the benefits of CBT may extend beyond the treatment period and uh, protect against relapse. Medications have limitation in those area, whereas CBT alters the lifestyle and they develop many skills which are useful to them in the day-to-day -day life. Thus, CBT forms an important tool of uh, intervention and occupies an important place in the psychosocial treatment of substance use disorders. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, there have been a um, few questions. Uh, can CBT be given for a group of people? Of course, there is a model uh, group CBT and uh, 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 it is a standard uh, format available and we have to uh, choose the clients in an appropriate manner. And uh, particularly in a COVID situation, uh, being close physically is going to be problematic. Uh, like we do now as a Zoom session, uh, the groups of people can be brought in through this uh, uh, tele uh, uh, media that can be continue considered. Uh, uh, and also, now there are a lot of safety precautions are being uh, uh, taught even in our center. Now we conduct uh, uh, group psychoeducation classes with adequate spacing among clients. Uh, so it is still possible. What preparation should be done uh, while providing CBT? Of course, a clear understanding of the patient's uh, condition is fundamental. And a person should be familiar with the CBT principles and they should have skills. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, learning opportunities are very few and it is uh, uh, still reach a desirable level. Uh, if somebody has got a, a reasonable skill in CBT, they can very well go ahead with uh, uh, treating with CBT. Something is better than nothing. Uh, how to help female young girls out of the substance use in India? Very challenging. Uh, once uh, in the past, uh, addiction was only a male phenomena, it is no more. Uh, even women smoke, women take alcohol, they use, they use hard substances. Uh, they, in fact, uh, there are special needs for adolescents when it comes to drug use, peer group acceptance, and the high level of impulsivity, uh, uh, limited skills, life skills they have developed, and their dependent nature on the family so uh, that makes it more challenging than treating an adult. Uh, there are uh, specific strategies which can be used in adolescents. Those uh, strategies can be tried. Could you tell us about uh, urge surfing? Yeah, well, uh, uh, many times we are not uh, aware of our own urges and craving. Being uh, uh, aware, increasing the self-awareness is very important. Many times we are in, uh, neglect and ignore and we don't focus on it, only to be suddenly surprised that we are uh, onto drugs. So being uh, highly self-aware of what is happening uh, is important component in the treatment of uh, uh, addictive disorders. Uh, with that, I complete my presentation. Thank you for your. Presentation, sir. A child learns from parents. Truly, we have learned in a crispy manner from you, sir. We are really grateful for giving your valuable time. Thank you, sir. Okay, you're welcome. Now I welcome Dr. Abhinav to take over the session. Yeah, good morning everybody. Uh, are my slides visible right now? Visible, sir. Then I'll stop. Uh, thanks, Dr. Selbraj. That was a really comprehensive and nice talk. And uh, truly, actually, I'm quite intimidated to go after someone as senior as you. Uh, my talk is actually perhaps a few steps before what Dr. Selbraj was talking about. In the sense that we're going to talk about a technique uh, for motivation enhancement, 
which is called motivational interviewing. So strategies like cognitive behavioral therapy and CBT are really only going to be applicable once the person that you are trying to apply the therapies to is willing, is ready, willing, and able to do the strategies you're suggesting to them. So motivational interviewing is actually one step before that about how to build up the motivation in them to change. Most people who are dependent on substances, when you ask them in detail about the substance use are ambivalent. Um, most of them don't come up with only positive feelings towards the substance. Uh, most of them in their uh, mind are also increasingly concerned about their substance use, though that does not reflect in their behavior. So what I'm going to be covering today are the essential four questions about this technique of motivational interview, which is what is it, how do we do it, when is it, uh, when are what strategies used, and why should we bother to move into it. So we've just had one introduction talk about a type of therapy called CBT. Uh, every type of therapy has their own has its own characteristics, its own stances that the person doing the therapy, the therapist, uh, assumes, and its own way of dealing with the problems that are put ahead of them, uh, ahead of you. So these are some of the points that characterize motivational interviewing as a technique. So this technique is directed. What this means is that unlike what many of us think of as classic therapy in our head, when we think about Freud or Freudian therapy, where the therapist is mostly only silent, the client talks with very little uh, feedback coming in from the therapist. This technique is not like that. The therapist assumes control of the session and can direct it at various points. It's a client-centered technique, which means that um, there isn't a there isn't a uniform format that is followed by every single individual. Uh, it has to be tailored to that individual, their personality, their context. The main uh, target here in motivational interviewing is to try to elicit change in behavior. Uh, that's the main focus of what we're looking at here. And like I said, most people with substance, depend substance dependence, when you actually probe in, will come out with some amount of ambivalence. Uh, they, they are not sure, do they really want to go ahead on this? There is, there is a conflict within them. They've not made up their mind uh, often. And it is about if this ambivalence is not present to develop this ambivalence, if it is present to help them resolve it in the direction of change. That is the target for this technique. These are very important points if one has to understand how motivational interviewing is different from any technique. And I think the strength of motivational interviewing is that uh, if done properly, the client and the person who has substance dependence does not feel that change is being imposed on them. Uh, we get from them all the points so you don't there, there is the big difference between giving education to the patient and motivation interviewing so if i am doing motivation interviewing to someone with alcohol that doesn't mean that i will start off immediately telling them all the ways that alcohol is bad for them. it means that i will ask them what do they think do they think alcohol has bad effects what effects do they think it has so by that's what I mean when we when we say that motivation is elicited from the client and we don't give them the answers, we try to get the answers from them. Generally, even if you think about yourself, uh, if there are patterns of behavior that you that are solid in you and that have been persistent for a long time, it's not easy to change those patterns of behavior. Usually a direct assault from a stranger, which is finally what you are when you're dealing with these clients, a direct frontal assault on their patterns of behavior usually ends up in the client avoiding you and not coming back to you. And the entire talk of change ending right there. So directly persuading is not what we're aiming for in motivation interviewing. Like I said, we're aiming to get things from the person 
and to help them realize that they somewhere or the other already know that this habit is bad for them but this habit is giving them more negative effects by now. that doesn't mean that the person who is doing motivational interviewing the therapist has to be silent all the time though yes we ask a lot of open ended questions and try to get a lot of answers back rather than providing the answers we can step into the session and change its direction if we feel that it's not going the way we would like it to so we have to understand that people are complex motivation keeps changing um the first thing to realize is that change is difficult the people have come to you because change is difficult and they were unable to do it themselves the motivation to do any difficult task keeps varying up and down i am reminded about all the times i've had to study for my exams the motivation to actually put down something which is pleasurable and take up something that is not pleasurable immediately for a long term gain that motivation keeps fluctuating in all of us so in this style of therapy in this style of motivation interviewing we try as far as possible for the relationship between the client and the therapist to be equitable rather than me imparting knowledge as an expert it's about me being a partner in this process and helping them through it you just directly scold them or fight them into it they are far more likely to either tell you what you want to hear and then never come back or fight again with you and break off contact right there so the whole spirit is of the therapist and the client collaborating for a common goal which is behavioral change and the last point like i mentioned before evocation versus education the classic example like i've given you i in motivational interviewing you don't read down the list of all the negative things that alcohol causes or all the problems with smoking no you get this out of the client what do they know about the negative effects of alcohol in smoking so that's about the what so what is this technique just a brief intro to it so now i'm going to move into the much more important clinically applicable how Yeah. how does how do we take the theory of what this technique is and use it there are uh, this is the most common mnemonic for uh, knowing the practices that you use in motivation interview which is there is e a r e s and i'm going to go into all of this in, in some detail in my next week slide so these are these dares are what the therapist is aiming to do in their session with the person uh the actual techniques we use to achieve the targets that were set out in dares are these the mnemonic for this is fours so like i said the style of hello? using yes hello yes hello hello i'm sorry is someone trying to say something to me no sir you make it okay so the techniques that are used for uh, achieving these targets uh, are what's listed out in these slides so as i mentioned before the therapist in motivational interviewing we often use a lot of open ended questions because we are not trying to give information to the client we are trying to get all of it from them they are treated as a resource for all your information so you wouldn't ask things like but you know alcohol is bad for you right you don't ask yes or no questions like that you would ask something you would ask things like what are your feelings about alcohol what do you think alcohol has given to you in your life So things like that, open-ended questions. So affirmations are also very important. I think this is the point Dr. Selvaraj also brought up the importance of giving positive reinforcement, positive feedback for any change. So right from the first session onwards, right from the first appointment onwards, recognizing that this is a difficult step, 
that a person has admitted that their substance use is beyond their control and has come for help itself is a very difficult step. I think we all know that it's not the easiest thing to go to uh, in an institution, often a mental health care institution or a rehab facility and admit that you have a problem. So the first interaction should start off with affirming that what they've done is a positive thing. And subsequently, at every instance, one has to look for opportunities to give a positive feedback back to this person who is doing something difficult in their life. So a technique called reflection, which again, I'll talk about a little bit more later on, it is basically when we are hearing what people are saying, it is important for us to actively listen, which means I'm actively processing everything the client is saying. One way to make sure that they understand when I'm listening to them, I am actively processing what they're saying is to give them a reflection of what we thought the emotional tone of what they just said to you was. So if a person is talking about how their problems in their marriage have caused increased anxiety in them and they, the only way they know how to deal with this anxiety is to drink alcohol, a reflection would be to say, I can see that, that you're feeling quite distressed right now and I can see how this, uh, this habit might be one of the ways that you're using to cope with distress. Am I correct in that? That, that you are reflecting the emotional tone, not the exact thing they said to you, but what you grasp from. And the last thing is to summarize. This is something which I, which most therapists will offer motivation and interviewing will do by the end of the session. So you summarize what all was said and talked about today. So like, for example, I'd say till now in this talk, what I have talked about is the basic funda of what is motivation interviewing and we have just started talking about the techniques of how we're going to use it. So that could be a brief summary of what all has happened so far. So the first target in our motivation interviewing as a process, so going back to the dares that I talked to you about, is developing discrepancy. Now, what does that mean? What does the discrepancy mean? So remember what I, what I told uh, all of you that Studies have found, and even in personal experience, I found that by the time people have a physical dependence and by the time they reach uh, professional health, there is usually some amount of conflict in their mind as to this substance. So discrepancy, when we talk about, is the discrepancy between what they think they should do, so their personal goals and their values and their targets, and what they are in fact doing. So a discrepancy in from their thought and their behavior. So that's what we are trying to develop and further even more. We're trying to put a highlight on it, circle it and show them. Let's see what you wanted, what your targets and goals are in your head, the kind of person you want to be in your head. For some reason, you don't seem to be that person. Could that reason be your substance use? So that would be actually developing some amount of discrepancy inside them. Why this is important is, remember, this entire tactic is to increase their motivation to do this very, very difficult thing of stopping a substance that they are physically dependent to or has become an important part of their life. So this, in essence, is what's going on in the head of many people with substance dependence who are coming to you for help. Yeah. All of us are in an are by nature, there is some inertia in all of us. Just like in physics, you need some amount of force to get a stationary object moving. Even psychologically, there is inertia to change. People tend to stay within the status quo. And often that is because this decisional balance that is put out in this image I've got from an organization's website, this decisional balance has not clearly tipped one side or the other. So you have not clearly decided whether the, the costs of continuing in this status quo are more or less than the benefits. So what your job as a therapist, number one, is to try to tip the balance of this decisional, uh, of, of the decision that is going on inside the client's mind towards change. So how do we know whether our 
efforts at increasing this discrepancy and our efforts at promoting change have worked at all. So we try to watch out during our sessions for talk from the patient that indicates that they might be moving towards change in their behavior. Uh, what I've labeled as change talk over here. So things like the client spontaneously bringing up disadvantages of what's going on right now. So he might say things like, I understand that I am spending a lot of money uh, on alcohol. The financial situation at home is quite dire because of the financial situation and my spending, my fights with my wife are increasing. That is worsening my marital problems as well. So this kind of talk is good prognostically speaking we're looking for it we're we are trying to see this because this is objective evidence that all of our uh, talking and our sessions are actually reaching somewhere so the client spontaneously coming up with advantages of change yes if i quit alcohol these are all the things i can expect will go better in my life i am of course using alcohol as an example the same model with the same format can be used across substances and really across behaviors. We can use it for any problem behavior. So if a person themselves is expressing optimism, that's a very important thing. That's one of the first things we're trying to do initially is to build up some optimism that this is possible, that this difficult thing, though difficult, is not impossible. And then finally, if they're clearly telling you that they intend to change, then number one, your first target of having resolved their ambivalence, having tipped the decision balance towards change, that's the, that's the clearest evidence you can get that you've been successful in doing that. So there are various techniques that you can use to actually encourage people along this path of thinking about change. And I'm going to look at some of them. The most common type of technique that therapists use when in these conversations when they're trying to elicit change are evocative questions. So I'm giving I've given some examples here. And you can see how firstly these are all open-ended questions because we are not trying to, it's very important that what you hear from the client you're sure is what is going on in their head and not that they're just telling you what you want to hear. So you ask them open-ended questions. So someone who is not very sure whether they want to change at all, not very sure whether they even need to change at all. So their motivation is, of the, is at the level, and we're going to look at stages later, is at the level that they have just about started thinking about quitting the substance or have not even started thinking about it. There, a very, a very useful question would be to ask them, Predict if you continue drinking 360 ml of alcohol uh, of liquor daily for the next five years, what do you think will happen? And then you see where are they? In what stage are they? Are they able to accurately predict what's going to happen? How optimistic or pessimistic are their predictions? And you take it on from there. <clears throat> in so if you see these questions in various different angles. We are trying to basically make the person start thinking about the consequences of their current behavior, the disadvantages of continuing this current behavior, as well as trying to slowly put them into the practicalities of how will they actually be able to change this. So the next step in our dare, our target, was to avoid argumentation. Like I said before, the problem with arguing with clients is are many. Number one, one has to realize that your power in this person's life is dictated by them. They have voluntarily come here for your help. They can at any point stop cooperating with you, at which point there is very little that you can do. So argumentation, number one, it puts your relationship with your client at strain. The rapport that you have tried to build with them might break. Number two, it's not very effective. Directly attacking and targeting fixed beliefs, fixed behavioral patterns rarely work. People beget on the defensive. Uh, and they might do that in a rather aggressive manner at times. 
uh, or they may retreat completely. So it's not a very effective tactic, which is why we try to avoid it during this time. So the question comes up that finally a lot of clients do put up resistance. Even people who say that they would like change, would like to quit their habit, when one actually starts suggesting things to them, suggesting the practical ways that they need to change their life, it is quite common to encounter some resistance. Like I said, we are all status quo uh, animals. We have some inertia in our behavior. So an important tactic in motivational viewing is that when you deal with resistance, you again, not directly attack it. So if you're dealing with a lot of resistance, we don't directly say what you're saying is wrong. So for example, if uh, someone has decided, yes, I would like to quit, then using some frameworks, something like what Dr. Shelgarad said, we've identified that one of the reasons that this person finds it difficult to quit is that they come back home from work every day on the same route. On that route, there is an alcohol shop. When they see that alcohol shop, they find it impossible to control that thing. So you may suggest, why don't you change the route? At which point that person may start giving you reasons why that is not possible. So that is the kind of resistance you practically in real life see when you are uh, giving suggestions. So what we have to do there is not to directly say all of your uh, objections are meaningless and small. They don't really mean, they don't really seem to matter. You can do this if you want to. That would be absolutely uh, non-productive. So what we would do is we would ask them, okay, so what do you think you can do? You yourself are saying that this alcohol shop is a problem for you. How do you want to deal with it? Get start getting solutions from them. Explore each solution. Then see which is the best solution. Or you could say, or oh, you seem a little unsure about whether you are, would be able to do this. And you may want to go back a step and then check again. Are you sure you want to change? Are you sure you want to quit the substance? Is that clear in your head? So you can go in either way. So this in practical terms is what we mean when we say roll with resistance. So these are some of the tactics and techniques you can use in your session to deal with resistance. Um, like I've mentioned before, reflection or reflective responses. So they, what I gave an example earlier, when you're saying, oh, you might, you seem to be upset about this, or you seem to be anxious about this. Those would be simple reflections. Amplified would be something like, um, in the example I gave of the person who's willing to change their route back from uh, work till home, you could say, oh, so what you're saying is that it's impossible for you to change this route. And since you can't change this route, it will be impossible for you to quit this uh, habit. Is that what you're saying? So that's an amplified response. This person gave you a little bit of resistance. You've amplified it to an extreme and presented to them. At which point, very often, the person will start backtracking and say, no, 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 it's not that bad. So you've actually got them on uh, your side of it. Or you could give a double-sided one. So you could say things like, so, so that's a little confusing. Earlier on in our last session, you said you would like to change and you realize it's difficult, but are willing to do it. But now our first strategy we seem to find is too difficult for you. What is going on? So you are, you are giving them how, you are showing to them how they themselves are on both sides of this argument and how that is stopping them from changing. So that's, that is a very classic and maybe one of the best ways of dealing with resistance. But there are, of course, other ways. If the resistance is very, very strong, you may want to abandon that area and say, okay, let's think about something else. Then you could try to reframe the resistance. So if the resistance is amenable to you, say, finding a silver lining to it, uh, or change the way that they are perceiving certain circumstances that would be what is called reframing. So if a person is using, I think a good example is, uh, again, what Dr. Selgaraj also said, about a person who has been able to quit alcohol for 90 days and has now had a lapse and had a drink and is very dejected. So from their perspective, the most important thing is the failure to continue 
in their absence. But it is important to change their point of view and point out to them that what is far more important is that they were able to stop the mind. Uh, you could emphasize personal choice when you're dealing with resistance. Point out that, of course, at the end of the day, everything is that person's choice. Um, these are only suggestions. Or you could have a paradoxical response. Say, okay, impossible to change. You continue doing this. Again, like I said, this paradoxical response, a bit like amplified reflection. Often what we see is that people change their tactic immediately. As soon as you put this forth, people were strongly arguing against something will start arguing. So then the next target from our DARE's framework again is to express empathy. Empathy in, in, in simple terms, what it means is that we need to understand that this is a difficult process. We are asking a lot from this person. Uh, this person, people are often trapped in these substance use cycles without even realizing how it has started. So by the time they trap, they don't know how to get out of it. So just understanding that this is tough on both sides, that would be the essence of expressing empathy. This is a small excerpt I took from a book called The Little Prince because I felt that it exactly typifies the kind of paradoxical cycles which from the outside seem so clearly illogical to all of us. But these are the kind of cycles that maintain the habits of alcohol dependence in people. So in this particular example, the person with an alcohol dependence problem says he's drinking out of shame and the shame is primarily because of his alcohol dependence problem. So that, that's the kind of cycle that is pretty common in people with substance, substance use. Again, uh, the, last, the last point with DARE's framework is to support self-efficacy. Self From throughout the entire process, it is important to emphasize how this is something that is finally in that other person's control to an extent. They can do think, something about their habits, even if it is difficult. So difficult, not impossible, is the, is the constant strategy that one goes with. But it is important to recognize that it is difficult. To pretend that it is not difficult shows that you've not exactly understood the depth of the problem there. Much like how we talked about eliciting change talk, we in the next, yeah, as we advance through motivational interviewing, start focusing on confidence talk. So when the sub person has decided that they definitely want to change, the next step is to make them more and more confident about actually doing that change. Similar techniques are used over there. So roughly we can divide motivation interviewing into two phases. The first phase addresses a person who is as yet undecided whether they want to change or has decided they do not want to change. So building up the motivation itself, just say, yes, I would like to change. Now, what should I do? And phase two is when you, where you uh, progress after that. It is in phase two that techniques like CBT are often used. So concepts from CBT, concepts from that type of therapy can be used throughout motivation. So again, uh, what one sees is that change is a very gradual process. Usually we depict change as spirals. So people take three steps forward, two steps back. Then again, three steps forward, two steps back. It is very rare that behavioral change happens in a linear fashion in which you're only seeing positive improvements across time. It fluctuates back and forth. This is the perhaps the defining theoretical concept that underlies a lot of uh, techniques that we are now using for substance dependence, and it has for decades. It's called the cycle of change. Um, if you read it, you will immediately see, and if you think about your own actions and any behavior cycle that you would like to change in yourself, you'll see how this is. Uh, this has very clear validity. It seems very obviously true. We all do work like this. That, that we progress from not even thinking about changing some behavior to start, we start thinking about changing our behavior. We start getting resources as to what we should do to change our behavior, actually do it. And then continuing. 
Now at that point, you could either continue it forever and never fall back into your problem behavior or you could relapse. Like I mentioned, the most common thing in substance dependence is multiple lapses. The usual pattern is for us to learn from each lapse and to make this entire cycle become broader and broader so that the relapses are more and more separated by time till finally they are not present. So actually, it's quite important to determine which phase is the client sitting opposite you, which phase is he in, because each phase has different techniques that you would use. Uh, it is unlikely to be very effective to immediately jump into practical um, suggestions to change a person's life if they are in pre-contemplation phase and have thus not even started thinking about changing their behavior. Uh, similarly, someone who has already decided that they want to change, they are unlikely to be very impressed if you then start telling them all the reasons they should change. So you need to see which stage of this cycle is the person sitting opposite you and the interventions that you provide in your session would then change based on the stage where they're at. So what I talked about right now are the classic motivational interviewing techniques. We use them quite often in my institute, especially for inpatients. But there is a reason why we use them, especially for inpatients. This is quite time consuming. Um, sessions take 30 to 40 minutes at least. Uh, we often don't start off with a clearly defined number of sessions. And so many clinicians felt the need to have some techniques for their OPD use and their outpatients where they do not have the time to have 40 minutes sessions with each person. So some of the principles that we talked about were used to come, come up with a new module in targeted primarily at clinicians sitting in their outpatients who have say 10 to 15 minutes to spend uh, with a person. There again, there is a mnemonic. This uh, topic is full of mnemonic. So the mnemonic here is frames. So what that would really look like in reality is that you're sitting in your OPD and you see someone who you realize is an alcohol dependence problem. Perhaps you are detoxing them in their withdrawal phase. You're trying to control their withdrawal. So the first thing here you see that everything is different because you have only 15 minutes. Here yeah. you are immediately jumping in and giving information, unlike in the last one. So you immediately give some feedback on the risk. Do you realize the risk that you've been taking? Do you realize this is your second or third withdrawal with some complications? The, the pattern of what is happening here doesn't seem to be good. You then remind them that change can only happen from them. It can only be internal. Externally, if imposed change will not happen. You may want to give them some specific advice where things like the anti craving strategies that Dr. Selvaraj mentioned would be very useful to provide at that point. The next time you feel like, really feel like drinking or really feel like smoking or whatever your target is, that craving time, use the four Ds, for example. A menu for, so give them several options. You pick what is most applicable to you. So even in the 4Ds, often people are confused. What do they actually do to distract themselves? So it's important to nail down a bit of a final plan. And the last two are common. A, a spirit of empathy. Nobody, uh, people with substance dependence are often very sensitive to judgment and criticism. They have received a lot of judgment and criticism. They are expecting the therapist to fall into the normal pattern of judging and criticizing them. Just breaking that normal pattern itself is a very useful thing in your session. And to give them some confidence that indeed this is possible. It is not, it is not an impossible thing. The slide I've got up is actually something that's used in the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. It's a brief intervention designed against the substance use. So actually what they do is they just ask one question of from a scale of zero to 10, how ready are you to cut back your use of whatever substance it is? Based on that one question and the score, they've actually given some plans for clinicians what to do. So you will notice again how this is 
a very practical modification of motivational interviewing to be used by all of us in our busy outpatient setting and is extremely useful in a low resource setting like India. Few traps that we need to avoid when we're trying to uh, do any non pharmacology uh, do any therapy for substance dependence. It is very important that there should be a conversation so if a person is giving you very short, short answers and you, have, you just keep questioning them and they only give short answers, it's important to bring that out and say, you don't seem to be fully participating in this. Is there something going on? Is there something I can do to make you more comfortable? Don't take sides. Often one, one is often in our setting, the client is brought to you by concerned family members who are very eager for you to take their side in this whole debate. It's very important right at the outset to clarify that your role is not to sit as a judge for disputes. Your role is to facilitate change. Number three, like I said, in motivation interviewing, the dynamic of the relationship between the therapist and the client is not that of an expert giving more information. It is of someone who has some skills uh, in, in a certain technique but is finally not an expert in this person's life. I also think this is just true. We are an expert. You can be an expert in motivation interviewing. You are not an expert in this person's life, their problems, their personality, what goes on in their head. Only they are experts. So you will have to get that information out from them and not just give them information. Don't jump into premature focus would be jumping to specific strategies before they're ready for it. So like I said, it's important to know which stage of motivation is the person sitting opposite you. It is important to recognize that stages of motivation can keep changing. So you will have to have a bit of a gauge on every session, uh, which stage is this person at right now? Is he stable in, your, in the motivation uh, in that same stage or is it fluctuating up and down? And it's important to not blame the person for their dependence. Um, Sometimes difficult to do because one, when one has invested time and energy into an outcome, one also feels personally invested in this. And thus, it is easy to take the next lapse into drinking or smoking or into trying to feel there's a personal upfront that something has gone wrong. That's not very productive, even if it is understandable. And later on in, so what often happens is that once someone has said, yes, I would like to change in your head, you think, okay, their ambivalence is gone. They have decided to change full stop, full steam ahead. Let's go on to other things. But ambivalence can keep coming back and forth. If the person is in at any point, you feel that there is a resistance. It was not there earlier. It's important to ask them, are you, are you still of the same mind that you were two weeks ago when you said you definitely want to change this habit or has something changed? And it is important to keep giving optimism. Substance dependence can be broken. Uh, it's, just a, it's just something that I see every day. It can be broken. It is difficult, but you can definitely minimize the harm that it causes. There, there is no doubt. So why do you, why do I strongly believe that people should know about motivation interviewing? And if you are in any way involved in the mental health care industry, definitely you need to know about this. Why I would say that is like I've mentioned before, how human beings and we and all of us uh, respond to calls to change. We are all of us predisposed in our heart. None of us really wants to change, even when it seems really, really obvious to those outside looking in that we need to change. So what motivational ha interviewing has going for it is that it works. It works because it accepts that human beings are complex, their motivations to change are complex, and it accepts that the person sitting opposite the table from you with a substance dependence habit still follows those rules that all human beings follow. So what do we know for sure till now is that in the field of substance dependence, some intervention in terms of counseling or motivation interviewing or using CBT, some intervention has uniformly been shown to be better than no intervention. Uh, though which is better and which is worse is very unclear. 
we do know, however, that the factors that determine. So if you look at studies that are trying to prognosticate uh, which people will be able to quit and which people will not, there are multiple factors, including how effective, how confident the therapist is. So that's the clinician effect. How much optimism are you able to generate in the person is a very good predictor of their ability to actually follow through with your plans. Um, it has been found that if we record interviews and note down the number of times the person spontaneously brings up change, what I call change talk earlier, that is a good predictor of which people are managed to quit uh, and which people do not. At the end of the day, we have mounting and very good scientific evidence for uh, the use of techniques like motivation, interviewing, and substance dependence, dependence to the point that it has almost become treatment of choice. Really. So what we are targeting for people is that they should be ready, willing, and able. If these three things are there, then we immediately can move on to more practical, real-life interventions as to what they need to change and specific about their life. Thank you. These are my references. So, uh, sir, uh, there are questions for you from the participant side. Uh, what one. is yeah. yeah? What is the success rate of your treatment? So personally, I, 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 in my center, we've not done any studies to show success rate. The reason for that is that we are following principles of motivational interviewing that can be used in various different forms. So there is something called motivational enhancement technique, which is a set number of sessions, I believe four sessions with a set content for each session. So you wouldn't need to do things like that to study. Overall, um, what we do know is that motivational interviewing definitely increases the amount of time till the next lapse. Uh, lifelong abstinence increases but overall rates would still would still hover around a quarter to 30 percent of people at interview 25 to 30 percent thank you sir uh, you are intelligent enough to pick up and stay with the topic of motivational interviewing sir you have discussed has the secrecy of motivational interviewing as our participants uh, kept putting it in the chat box like it has been uh, it has given a real insight into the uh, practical scenario you have shaded our axons and dendrites bright enough to move towards the clinical practical application thank you sir for your patience with time factor it was a great presentation sir. thank you I am delighted to thank God Almighty for blessing us on this occasion. Uh, I am delighted to thank uh, Principal Madam Dr. Jai Suga, uh, untiring leader who turns impossible into possible. My sincere thanks to the eminent speakers, Dr. Mail Wagnan, Dr. Selvaraj, and Dr. Abhinav for their excellent coverage on the topic. Uh, my special word of gratitude to Professor Meera Saravaran, HOD, Department of Mental Health Nursing, and Mr. Baskaran, to all the participants from various parts of the globe who have participated and for it being the pillar of our support. And eat healthy and stay healthy. Let's all support for boost up abstinence, break up substance use, and bring out strategies. Once again, thank you all. So I must really thank uh, personally, Dr. Selvaraj, Dr. Mail Wagner, and Dr. Apinau for being uh, excellent coverage and uh, many comments from the delegates has been received uh, where a lot of them are doing the studies on this cognitive behavioral therapy also. So they said your content was excellent for them to be the source of information for their studies also. We must really personally thank from PSG 
and thank you sir for spending your valuable time with us thank you sir you are welcome madam thank you ma'am thank you so we take leave i take leave uh, uh, let me get in touch with you later good day to you all thank you sir. thank you sir Oh, Rajini. Rajini. Rajini.